let me thank the organizers uh, for inviting me to uh, Doha, Islamic Finance Conference. Great to be here. Uh, I'm going to uh, briefly talk about the state of the global economy and uh, relate my discussion to the issue of uh, financial crisis in the context of rapid increase in debt. So uh, World Bank uh, produces a publication called Global Economic Prospects. Uh, it is released in January and June every year. The latest issue came out uh, in January and the title was uh, Slow Growth and Policy Challenges. Uh, so I strongly urge you to visit our webpage and uh, look at the publication. What I would like to do, uh, just focus on three questions today, uh, give you a glimpse of our views about the state of the global economy. The first question is, uh, how is the health of the global economy? And there, uh, obviously, uh, health uh, of the global economy uh, is uh, weak, uh, in literal terms. Uh, given the kind of the, the coronavirus, its rapid uh, spread, uh, it's true uh, human uh, tragedy. Uh, second question, what are the major risks confronting the global economy? There, uh, there are a number of risks. I am just going to focus on two of them. Uh, the first one is the spread of uh, coronavirus, and the second one is a possibility of uh, financial stress because of rapid increase in debt around the world, especially in emerging market developed economies. Uh, of course, there are multiple other risks, including uh, re escalation of trade tensions, uh, natural disasters, uh, sharper than expected slowdown in major economies. But uh, given the time constraints, I'm not going to discuss those. And finally, the third question, uh, what should be the policy responses? And I will uh, briefly discuss those. So let me focus on the first question. Now, before the uh, rapid spread of the corona outbreak, uh, activity around the world was stabilizing at weak levels. So there are certain indicators of activity we follow uh, these indicators of activity look at the manufacturing and services. And here you see the, uh, the, the, the around the world uh, advanced economies, emerging developing economies, and uh, trade indicators. And all of them, uh, they are weak, but they are getting, in a sense, uh, better. Uh, at least this was the view in January. Now, um, this uh, tentative signs of stabilization, of course, now are uh, at risk. Why? Uh, we will discuss that a little bit uh, more when I get to the risks. So early in January, when we released our forecast, uh, we thought that the global economy will see a marginal improvement in growth. Last year, growth was about 2.4%. We thought that it will go up to 2.5% this year. In light of recent developments, we think that uh, that number uh, could be lower, especially in the first half of the year. Now, what is important in this table, how our forecast change relative to last year in June. So from June 2019 to January 2020, when you look at these forecast revisions on the right, what you see, we basically downgraded all of our forecasts for all countries, all country groups and for all regions. Uh, advanced economy forecast downgraded 0.2 percentage points. Uh, emerging developing economies uh, forecast downgraded 0.5 percentage points. So all in all, um, we were quite optimistic uh, in uh, June 2019 and we downgraded our forecast in January 2020. If you look at the regions, uh, you see across the board downgrades as well. And there, uh, you can focus on Middle East, North Africa. Last year, growth was close to basically zero. Per capita growth was negative. This was the case for Sub-Saharan Africa. And of course, it was the case for uh, Latin American countries as well. Uh, these uh, three regions uh, have serious problems in terms of generating 
per capita income growth, and last year was another uh, manifestation of that. Now, um, so the growth uh, this year, uh, we were expecting a bit of a pickup, but still weak. And then, of course, the, the, these risks we were thinking of, at least one of them uh, materialized, a major uh, health scare in the context of corona. It's still quite early to think about the global impact and the growth impact of the coronavirus, but um, there is one important issue we should uh, keep in mind. And that issue is how important China. When people think about the corona epidemic, they basically go back to 2003, the SARS epidemic, and how you know, that affected the global economy. In fact, at that time, uh, global growth was quite high. Uh, the Chinese economy was growing around uh, 10%. And, and the epidemic uh, was contained pretty quickly. So the impact on the global economy uh, was uh, quite minimal. In fact, at the end of the year, 2003, global growth was higher than what we expected at the beginning. Now, uh, since then, uh, China has become much more important, however you look at it. If you look at it, you know, how important China in terms of uh, it is contribution to global output, uh, that is around, you know, 13% if you think about market exchange rates, and it is around 20% if you think about PPP terms. But more importantly, China accounts for one-third of global growth. So when I said last year growth was 2.4%, 0 0.8 percentage points of that came from China. So if Chinese economy slows significantly, that has significant implications for the rest of the world. And uh, in the first quarter of this year, in all likelihood, we will see a sharp slowdown in China, and that will have implications for the global economy. <clears throat> now, let me turn to the second important risk, which we are focusing on, and that is about rapid accumulation of debt. So since 2010, emerging market developing economies ramped up that accumulation like we have never seen since 1970s. That went up by about 55 percentage points. Now it's close to 170%. Most people think that, oh, this is about China. No, even if you take out China, there is significant increase in debt. In fact, when we think about that accumulation since 1970, this episode that started in 2010 is the fastest, largest, and most synchronized broad-based episode in terms of that accumulation. Whether you take into account China or you exclude China, it doesn't matter. It is the largest debt accumulation episode we have seen since 1970. So uh, what is the big problem here? The big problem here, countries, of course, always accumulate that, and they did accumulate it prior to 2010 as well. When they were accumulating that at that time, they were growing faster and faster prior to the crisis. In other words, while they were accumulating that, their debt to GDP ratios was going down. That's what you have on the left in this graph. But since 2010, as they accumulate that, their growth rates decline. So if you continuously accumulate that, and you are growing less and less, what will happen eventually? Of course, you hit a wall. And you might end up with a crisis. That's the topic of this session. Now, there is this idea that debt is very cheap, and it is healthy to borrow and invest in productive purposes. It is true that that is cheap. And as you can see, over the 1970-2007, average nominal interest rate was around 6%. Now that number is close to zero, and in all likelihood, it is going to remain close to zero as far as the eye can see. The problem is that when countries accumulate debt, even if their growth rates higher than the cost of borrowing, 
they end up having larger and larger debt if they start with primary deficits. So if you have deficits and you accumulate that, you uh, end up basically uh, having a larger debt relative to your GDP. And if that happens, eventually, these rapid debt accumulation episodes end. One out of two of these episodes end up with crisis. They could be currency crisis, they could be banking crisis, they could be outright debt crisis. So we looked at 500 episodes since 1970, and whether countries accumulate private debt or they accumulate public debt, they eventually have some problems. In some cases, those problems turn into crisis. So when those problems turn into crisis, the impact on economic growth is quite significant. So you look at countries, they accumulate debt and they don't have crisis, and those, they accumulate have debt and they have crisis, their economic performance over a period of time is much worse. Dr. Ayahana, we have less than five minutes, so if you can wrap it up. Yeah. So the big issue is that how should we think about the probability of these episodes when we have countries accumulating debt quite rapidly? And one way of thinking about that, what type of shocks that could hit these economies and translate into crisis? There are at least two types of shocks we focus on. One, a sharp reduction in economic growth. If that happens, of course, the likelihood of a crisis increases uh, by twofold. Or interest rates increase rapidly. That happened in early 1980s. In fact, that happened in 2018. Some major emerging markets had problems. In that case as well, the crisis probability increases significantly. But one of the important predictors of crisis is that whether you accumulate that rapidly or not. If you accumulate that, uh, whether you accumulate government debt or private debt, the likelihood of crisis increases relative to an episode if you do not accumulate that. Now, so where are we in terms of debt accumulation? If you think about government debt relative to previous episodes, in fact, uh, Government debt levels tend to be lower than what we saw historical averages. If you look at private debt, though, uh, uh, a number of uh, countries really ramped up their private debt stock, so the private debt levels are now higher than historical averages. So let me turn to the third question. What are the important policy messages? With respect to coronavirus, there is no question public health system should be ready for potential outbreaks. Now, what about the debt issue? That issue ultimately requires thinking carefully debt management policies and transparency. Whether you borrow or lend, you would like to conduct those transactions in a transparent fashion. What happened over the past decade, there are some new actors lending aggressively, and there are some new actors borrowing aggressively. And global community would like to have more information about these transactions and get a good sense of the lender's borrow, uh, balance sheets as well as borrower's balance sheets. And that all is all about having uh, a transparent debt management system. So let me uh, conclude. I asked three questions. The first one was, how is the health of the global economy? Obviously, global economy is going through a rough period. Uh, the hope is that this uh, rough period will end uh, in the first quarter, but it's going to really depend on the evolution of this uh, corona outbreak. The second question, what are the main risks confronting the global economy? Uh, there is a wide range of risks. 
we need to be mindful of. The, the coronavirus, of course, is the number one. In this region as well, uh, rapid accumulation of debt, especially private debt, is something we need to be mindful of. And finally, what are the important policies for governments to undertake uh, uh, in an environment when you have economies are highly integrated? Any threat to public health systems should be clearly you know, examined transparently communicated and, and uh, credibly, uh, basically, uh, uh, executed with well-defined uh, policies. The second issue, I discussed the uh, debt issue, the rapid increase in debt, and their debt management policy is uh, critical, and uh, one of the critical issues we focus on nowadays, uh, improving uh, transparency of lending and borrowing in our uh, member countries. But uh, let me stop here. Thank you very much. Uh, Shukran Dr. Ayhan.